Eleven days after she died at the age of 96, the drumming has ceased, the pipes have fallen silent, the march of boots and procession routes has stilled, and Queen Elizabeth has been laid to rest. About 2,000 people attended her state funeral at Westminster Abbey in London. There, a congregation of kings and queens, prime ministers and presidents, including from the Commonwealth, a head-turning array of the great and the good, as one journalist put it, were there to mark the event, and thousands of ordinary people travelled into London. The late Queen's coffin was later taken to Windsor Castle for a more intimate committal service, and finally, a private burial. In grief and also in, <clears throat> in profound thanksgiving, we come to this house of God, to a place of prayer, to a church where remembrance and hope are sacred duties. Here, where Queen Elizabeth was married and crowned, we gather from across the nation, from the Commonwealth, and from the nations of the world, to mourn our loss, to remember her long life of selfless service and ensure confidence to commit her to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. With gratitude, we remember her unswerving commitment to a high calling over so many years as Queen and Head of the Commonwealth. With admiration, we recall her lifelong sense of duty and dedication to her people. With thanksgiving, we praise God for her constant example of Christian faith and devotion. With affection, we recall her love for her family and her commitment to the causes she held dear. Now, in silence, let us in our hearts and minds recall our many reasons for thanksgiving pray for all members of her family and commend Queen Elizabeth to the care and keeping of Almighty God. Well, to help us look back at the day and at the remarkable life of Queen Elizabeth, as well as forward to the new reign of King Charles, I'm joined now in the Abuja studio by the Rwandan High Commissioner to Nigeria, Stanislas Kamanzi, and from our Lagos studio by the Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, Ehosa Osage. And I'm also joined from the UK by Arise Special Correspondent, Dan Warren. Now, let me come to you first, uh, Dan, uh, a state funeral that was the largest international event the UK has hosted for decades, perhaps ever, hundreds of world leaders and other dignitaries in attendance, a huge global audience watching, thousands of people waiting to get a good view of that historic event, plus of course all the security and the world's media. Bring us the day as you saw it unfold. Pressure on the organisers and uh, basically it's, uh, the, the, the Duke of Kent has been planning this for over 20 uh, years uh, with a lot of uh, input from uh, the late Queen herself and basically the organisation uh, paid off as you, you, you said we saw uh, uh, presidents and prime ministers and royalty from all countries uh, arriving over the weekend yesterday of course there was uh, King Charles greeted them all at a, a banquet in, uh, in uh, Buckingham Palace and then today um, they, they arrived to Westminster Abbey, the uh, uh, first time a, a royal funeral in many, many years has taken place in, in such a venue. And um, uh, there was no reported problem problems with anybody arriving. Uh, there was uh, a lot of controversy here in the UK that uh, uh, some heads of state were going to have to be on a bus and be bussed in to Westminster Abbey short because there wasn't the um, infrastructure in London uh, with uh, to, to get everybody in and secure and uh, uh, appropriately uh, move from place to place. But no problems at all. Of course, uh, US President Biden was allowed his own uh, uh, convoy and um, 
and the beast uh, everybody arrived on time and of course uh, an amazing service uh, in um, uh, the um, in Westminster Abbey of course the choreography of such uh, marching um, before and afterwards where they went off to uh, uh, Buckingham Palace and then on to Windsor for her final journey the, these rehearsals have been taking place at three o'clock in the morning over the last few days to make sure the choreography was absolutely uh, spot on to the uh, mainly to the uh, Beethoven's uh, March the first um, and then of course arriving into Windsor and another uh, public service before um, a private service which is uh, taking place or the, the end taking place uh, now but certainly showed uh, what that uh, the UK can certainly put on uh, pomp and ceremony. Well, absolutely. I mean, it was something really to watch. I mean, absolutely captivating uh, in, in the majesty of it all. Uh, and let me come to you uh, in Lagos, the Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, Ehose Osage. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And of course, uh, when you reflect on all this and uh, why it's such a big deal, the Queen was arguably the world's most famous and possibly in some ways least known woman because of how private she was with her emotions and her politics. Well, I, I think it's um, one time that you would look at in world history and, and say truly of a, of a fact that the world moves in cycles of individuals that make the world really what it is. It has to be so with the queen. And I, I, I think that the, the best way to capture her moment in history is not about her private life. In fact, if anything, her private life became very public and global um, from when she was such a young um, um, teenager. You will recall, of course, the circumstances that, you know, um, heralded her ascendancy and how, you know, even as a private person, you, you know, she, she, she remains one of those people. You will talk about tales of what young people do when they find love, and she found love very early, and um, she followed through with her love, uh, ascending the throne when she did at a very tender age and, you know, spent seven decades, you know, all through. So you may talk about her private life, her politics and so on, but those were the defining elements of, you know, her total um, um, consequential life, you know, for global affairs. So I would say, you know, that, you know, she represents, you know, one of those very notable um, landmarks in terms of personality types um, for the human um, race and for the global community, which is why even in her death, she's been so globally celebrated. Um, so I, I think that, you know, um, you, you want a mix of, you know, what you might call the private and the public. She epitomized all of those things. She balanced them. Uh, but above all, I think that she emerged as you know, some kind of um, personality um, role model for um, the monarchy, for people, for women, um, even for, you know, um, the, the people of, of the UK itself and for people of the Commonwealth. I think that the outpouring of emotions, the outpouring of love, the, the, the kinds of things that we have seen, people coming from all over the world, including the Caribbeans and, and Asia and, and Africa, not to mention North America and so on. All of these things will go to show, you know, that she has meant so much, you know, to the world. Well, thank you very much indeed for putting that in perspective. And let me come to you, uh, High Commissioner Stanislas Kamanzi, who's of course the High Commissioner of Rwanda to Nigeria. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I understand the Rwandan High Commissioner to London was inside the Abbey for the funeral service, so your country well represented at today's event. Indeed uh, it was, and uh, actually if I may correct, uh, President Paul Kagame was uh, 
attended the funeral of, the, of Queen Elizabeth. And uh, it was indeed um, very important for Rwanda to be represented at that level uh, in connection with uh, the good relations that uh, uh, our two countries have, but also the prominence of uh, the late Queen, uh, who has been uh, a global leader. Uh, so it was very important. Yes, and, and of course, um, in that respect, uh, well, thank you for clarifying the fact that Paul Kagame actually attended, uh, because the, the last we heard it was the uh, Rwandan High Commissioner, but it's a good thing that he was there. Rwanda, of course, admitted into the Commonwealth in 2009 as its 54th member, despite being without a British colonial past. Uh, your, your reflections on that um, for us? Sure, that's actually part of the legacy of uh, the late Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, she led the process uh, of uh, transitioning from the British Commonwealth to the Commonwealth of Nations, uh, wh uh, whose framework allowed uh, countries that have uh, no colonial ties with uh, Britain uh, to be part of that uh, important organization. So as Rwanda, uh, we, we do aspire to the values that are common to uh, the, membership, uh, the membership of the Commonwealth prior to our admission. And uh, that's how we came in and uh, are ready to play our uh, role uh, in complementarity with the others, especially now that uh, uh, Rwanda uh, uh, assumed uh, uh, the chair in office of the organization. Yes, uh, and thank you very much for um, putting that in perspective for us. So let me come back to you, Dan Warren, in the UK. Um, tell us about Westminster Abbey and the significance of the funeral taking place there, um, a place where, as Princess Elizabeth, she was married as Princess Elizabeth, and then she was also crowned queen there. Uh, in, indeed, Charles. Um, obviously, Westminster Abbey is so close to uh, the Palace of Westminster, the, the home of uh, what was her her, her government. Um, of course, uh, famous known for for Big Ben, the Bell, and the Elizabeth Tower, which was named after her during her reign. But uh, uh, as you say, the the Abbey was a significant. Uh, we, we normally see lots of royal occasions take place in St Paul's Cathedral, which is further east in the uh, city of London. Uh, however, when the Queen made the arrangements, basically she wanted to come back home, as she called it. Um, as you said, she got she got married there and uh, was uh, coronated uh, in such a, a building. And also uh, about capacity issues. This was. Uh, as, as we've mentioned, so many world leaders, so many members of royal families, not just here in the, the UK, but around the world, it needed a venue that basically could could cope with the, the, the number of people attending and have the spectacle uh, of the event it deserved. And uh, uh, it, is, it has been noted that uh, basically the, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, was insistent that um, it took place in the Abbey. Yes, indeed. And uh, going to Lagos, our studios in Lagos there, and the Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, uh, Ehosa Osage, uh, thank you for staying with us. Uh, how does this kind of event, um, all that stirring solemnity that, that happened today, reflect on Britain's role? in the world? Does it make Britain stand taller and prouder, even though it doesn't quite rightly have the empire anymore? Or, or, or it makes no real difference in its continued search for a new global role for itself? Well, thank you, Charles. I think the global role um, is something that has to be put in proper perspective. We're coming from you know, an empire you know, period of the British you know, prominence in world affairs, the, the one that involved the colonization of large parts of you know, um, Asia and Africa and um, 
uh, you know, the distant size of Australasia and so on. I think what this means for all of us is a global culture of, if you like, some reconciliation and forgiveness. Not too long ago, there were issues of reparation, issues of reparation and issues of how to deal with the colonial past and you know, not, not forgetting that decolonization remains a very potent um, um, force in, in, in world affairs. Um, so what the, 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 the demise and all of this that we are doing for the Queen would represent would be it's a period to have a review of the role of the United Kingdom as a whole in world affairs. It's a period to look at you know, um, the British past and, and, and what the British moment of, in the present would represent for all of us. Now, the Commonwealth remains the greatest legacy you know, that um, England you know, would push for all the time. And I think the, the Queen um, played a very prominent role in ensuring that the Commonwealth you know, continued to play um, some relevant part in the lives of uh, former colonies. Um, we had the meeting in Rwanda um, earlier in the year, uh, just before the Queen passed. And I think it was a time to um, talk about the, the relevance of, of, of the UK itself, of the Commonwealth, and the kinds of roles that the Commonwealth would be expected to play um, as, as a major um, organization in world affairs. So I see this as a juncture, um, first for bringing back you know, all of the things that colonization would have represented all of the things that would make us you know, move away from colonization to decolonization, a process that the Commonwealth of Nations has always insisted that the, the UK has to lead. Um, it's not only about empire building, it's also about empire you know, uh, reinvention along, along the lines of progress for former colonies. So I think that going forward, it is time for all of these associations that we've had with the UK uh, to come back fully on board. Um, now the UK has left you know, the European Union, Brexit and all of that. It's a time to begin to reenact new beginnings for its dealings with the very close family nations you know, that the UK has dealt with over time. Right. And I that, think that a, you know, um, King Charles, Right, go King, on, just finish your thought. King Charles yes. III himself, yes. Go on, finish your thought. So I was saying that King Charles has already laid the foundations for new beginnings, um, even in the Commonwealth, uh, because at the last meeting, he um, had enunciated certain of the um, new roads, the new routes, the new vistas of opportunity. Um, it's the commerce, it's the economy, it's the development, it's the progress and how the Commonwealth can be reorganized, reinvented, to be an engine room. You know, um, it, has, it has done well in areas of decolonization. We would never forget the role of the Commonwealth in the transition in South Africa, the eventual demise of apartheid. The Commonwealth you know, um, acquitted itself fairly well there. We would not forget the role of the Commonwealth in the education sphere. We have the Association of Commonwealth Universities that has been very active. Now the Commonwealth is pushing in the direction of youth progress and youth development in a digital world, in a world ruled by artificial intelligence and, you know, um, those, those new forms of uh, right. okay. industrial uh, revolution. Uh, uh, I, I so one the, expects, yes. Right, yes. okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for that comprehensive uh, analysis there. And let me come to you, uh, Stanislas Kamanzi, the uh, Rwandan High Commissioner to Nigeria, um, the Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, speaking just a, a, a hot second ago, um, saying that this is, is rather like a turning point. Does it feel like that 
to you a turning point for the UK and the Commonwealth, given that it is clearly the end of an era? Well, uh, it's an end of, of uh, the era somehow as uh, a monarch is taking over from another monarch. And, uh, 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 and uh, one would expect definitely that uh, the, the, the things can be charted in some way, but uh, I would uh, uh, just uh, uh, be a little bit cautious to, 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 to mention that uh, continuity, continuity will, be, will, be, will be assured. Uh, Professor Osage uh, mentioned uh, uh, some of the matters that we discussed in the, you know, during the, uh, the concluded uh, program in Ichigari. Uh, those uh, points were discussed uh, you know, during the life of the late queen, and uh, uh, ex except that she wasn't there, she wasn't present. Mm. But one would say that uh, they were chatted, they were thought of, they were um, uh, put on the agenda with her consent, her her her, her intervention, mm. her interaction with uh, other actors, including uh, with. Uh, the, with the, the new king, with the mm. king Ch Charles the third, so I, I I can say with no no mistake that there will be continuity, but uh, definitely as the world changes, there will be uh, refinements to adapt to those changes, uh, which I I believe the new uh, uh, the, the new uh, um, uh, the, the new leadership, uh, uh, the new monarch of the United, of the United Kingdom. Uh, in collaboration with the other uh, leaders within the Commonwealth, we'll find a way of uh, uh, styling, of, uh, uh, of uh, shaping in a, a constructive way, in a way that uh, uh, helps help move forward, take into account new challenges and how they can be overcome. I'm staying with that theme and, and staying with you, mm. uh, uh, High Commissioner Kamanzi. Mm. I mean, as we said previously, R Rwanda really had no colonial, you know, past with Britain or any constitutional link mm -hmm. to Britain. It was a former colony of Germany and Belgium, mm -hmm. if I've got my facts right. Um, but just following up on what you said and what um, the, the Director General of the Nigerian International uh, uh, international agency was speaking about it you know um, what was it about the economic political and cultural uniqueness of the Commonwealth that made Rwanda want to join the group uh, first of all uh, let's talk about numbers the membership uh, of the Commonwealth which uh, when he joined was at uh, uh, 53 we made the 54th member now we have two other countries that have uh, joined, uh, Gabon and Togo. So that's uh, a wide community of nations, uh, uh, geographically located in various parts of the world. Uh, and uh, each one in its own region are offering, um, uh, offering opportunities to tap. Uh, from all perspectives, uh, mm. trade, from uh, you know, tourism, uh, exchange in experiences as uh, we, we, we transform, as a nation transform from uh, especially, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we countries that are in the cluster of, devel you know, of de developing nations. So all those uh, were uh, uh, factors that were, were you, know, play, you know, were at play uh, as Rwanda apply to become a member of the Commonwealth and uh, since uh, our admission indeed uh, we've, we've been um, we, we, we've benefited a lot and we're looking forward to benefiting from more as we also exchange with others as we contribute to uh, what can benefit to uh, the rest of the membership as well. Right and, and let me let's uh, return to the UK and, and to Dan Warren uh, arrive special correspondent. Uh, we are, of course, we've been talking about the Commonwealth and about King Charles, but really today is still about the Queen. Um, she was laid to rest uh, earlier, or in the process of being laid to rest. And it's amazing, isn't it, Dan, that how this Queen, this woman who 
kept herself from the media was so much a part of the media. Yes, um, and so already in the programme we're discussing how um, she kept her private life very private and in fact it was probably her, her children and their children that kept that their private lives were in the uh, uh, newspapers a lot but for the, the Queen herself um, she she basically took the, the role uh, with dignity and I think this is something that uh, Obviously, over the last uh, 11 days, many uh, correspondents, many analysts have been discussing how there is the, the, the secret life to the Queen, if you like, because um, this woman that was so powerful, um, but actually so down to earth and probably the complete opposite to a, a celebrity or to a leader or a, a head of state like any other country. Uh, and I think it's certainly going to be interesting to see um, how uh, King Charles basically takes the, 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 the reins and goes forward from, from what, in, in effect, she has kept a lot very, very private. OK, thanks for that, Dan. And let me come to you, um, the Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, uh, Ehosa Osage. We've got just about two minutes left, so if you could be reasonably brief, that would be good. Some countries in the Caribbean have already clearly signaled their desire to move to become republics. It obviously doesn't necessarily mean that they'll leave the Commonwealth, uh, and the Commonwealth itself could still survive. But the realms that are in the Commonwealth, of which King Charles is head of state, that could change, couldn't it? Might that have a knock-on effect on the role of the Commonwealth and on King Charles's position as head of the Commonwealth? Well, not, not exactly. Um, Nigeria was, uh, you know, in that shoe um, a long time ago. Nigeria moved on from being um, the, the queen as, as governor, head of um, government. Um, we became Republican in 1963. And, you know, today, New Zealand and Australia um, still have the, the king as he is now, as um, the head of government in those places. So it's not only in the Caribbean. Chances are that these countries will push and um, they become republics. Uh, but that does not change the ties that they have with the Commonwealth, uh, just as didn't happen in the case of Nigeria. And I think that as countries become a little more conscious of the need to be more decolonialist, uh, republican determination and declarations are not ruled out. Well, okay, we've still got a minute or so, so let me give that last word to you still, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Doctor, Professor uh, Osagie. Um, this event clearly shows that even though it doesn't have the empire, Britain clearly has friends, doesn't it? Even though some of those friends are arguably slightly dodgy. Yes, but this was the captivation of the queen herself. This was the captivation of the over seven decades that she had. And how, you know, as they say in the parlance of you know, psychology, she, she was the queen of hearts and of minds. Um, so um, this has enhanced, you know, Britain's overall position in, in global affairs. Um, but don't forget it. You know, that part of what she succeeded in doing is, is to see how the stability of the old order represented by the monarchy um, can be made not just compatible with, but also, you know, um, very uh, proactively compatible with modernity. And, and she, as many uh, heads of government and state have um, openly asserted, she represented that stability over time. She, she has helped, you know, um, to keep the old order alive. And therefore, one expects that the British monarchy would continue along those paths uh, because it helps the world, just as we have seen in all of the things that the Queen did. She was, you know, a mother of the universe, almost like. I want to thank you very much indeed, uh, 
Professor Ehosa Osage, who's the Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, and he was joining us there from uh, Lagos. And also, of course, um, uh, the Rwandan High Commissioner to Nigeria, Stanislas Kamanzi, who is with me here in Abuja. And last but certainly not least, our I Special Correspondent, Dan Warren, who was talking to me there from the UK. Thank you very much indeed to all of you.